That was good. Well, this morning, I just want to ask you a question. Have you ever experienced the wilderness? Have you ever experienced the wilderness? Uh, I had the opportunity to uh, watch a program, actually a couple, in fact. I don't know what necessarily drew me to these particular programs, but they were two series dealing with people who were surviving in the Arctic. So I don't know if you've ever had this adventurous spirit where you just wanted to go and see how long you could survive. I'm not much of, an, of a risk taker. I'm a bit of risk adverse. But, but I think some of you have this spirit that just says, I want to go and, and risk it all. I have people in my family like that. I'm the one that watches them on the thrill rides. But for, for this series, the, the one particular I watched in, in, at first was one where there were 10 contestants. And it was a show. It was a, it was a, a show where you could win a prize. And it's usually money. So this was a prize that was large. And the, the large prize went to the person that survived the longest. There was no end. We had no idea how long the person that was going to win would survive. They had no idea how long that they would survive. They went to the Arctic in the middle of September. Now, in, in the Arctic, the nights uh, get short. Or, or sorry, the, the days get very short. So the light amount during the day is smaller and smaller and smaller as you enter into the winter. And these people were, out of, out of my experience, some of the most incredible people I've ever witnessed in my life. They lived on absolutely what was in the land. They had nothing to take with them. They had no food with them. They had to live off the land. And so they had to gather, pick, fish, hunt, whatever they could do to forage, to find out whatever they had to, to, to eat in the wilderness. And they were, I mean, I've, I've known new things about eating squirrel and Arctic hare and how I can fish with absolutely nothing but a tin can. And, like, I can, I can just watch these people and stand in amazement. And the winner was, like, after he had killed a moose and uh, with a hatchet came and slayed, a, a, I think it was, like, a, some wild animal. I'm trying to think quickly what it was. He just, he didn't care. He just was going for it. And he ate everything that he could find. It was a wolverine, that, by the way, that he killed. And with his bare hands, after he had shot it from a distance, then he went and hacked it with a hatchet. Like, it sounds, this is a great thing for a Sunday morning sermon. But the point is, the point is, he was, he was going for it. And he, in fact, he won. Like, he lasted for like 72 days out in the wilderness because he knew how to survive. There was a second show. It was a little more of a reality show where there were four teams pitted against each other. 16 contestants playing for a half million dollars. And they, or, or for, or maybe, maybe it was a million dollars. I don't even know, but it was some large amount of money that there was only one team that was going to win. And at first, you know, everyone comes in with this idea that we're all just going to come in with our strength and our experience, and we all know how to make fire, and we know how to hunt, and we know how to do all these things that are help, help to keep us alive. But as time goes on, hunger sets in, and I don't know, we talked a bit about being hangry. There's something about being hangry that you just go and you go in a different direction than you would normally, and you do things that you just wouldn't normally do under the pressure of the hunger and the circumstance and the cold and the wet. In fact, after about, you know, four days, there were probably four people that just said, I'm out. This is not for me. I'm too much of a city person for this. Like, I am just gone. Some people were sick. Some people were just tired. They were getting ill. They were drinking the water but didn't realize it had bacteria in it or they took the chance. They probably knew it was a possibility, but it seemed like every time they drank it, they got sick and, and they were, ex, you know, extracted from the game. And the only way to get extracted from this game is if you shot your flare. There was no them coming in and removing you. You were had to remove yourself. And one by one, the flares went up. Boom, boom, boom. And everyone would celebrate every time a flare would go because it was one step closer to them winning the big prize. Well, I'll explain a little bit more later about how this ended. But the fact is that the pressures, as every day went on, in the original series, the hunger sets in, the cold sets in, the ice, you know, the water freezes over, becomes ice, and makes fishing in it almost an impossibility for some of these people. Like, when things are cut off from you, when the situation changes, when the pressure is instilled, when the wilderness is the wilderness, that's when we're put to the test. 
It's not at the beginning. Everyone says, oh, I can enter the wilderness. But it's when you're in the wilderness that you start asking, who am I really? Well, Jesus enters this period in the wilderness. Just to set it up for you a little bit, Jesus was introduced to the world by this guy named John the Baptist. We call him John the Baptist because he was baptizing people. This new phenomenon where he was coming around and saying, your allegiance to to God can be shown in this demonstration of what was called baptism. The symbolic going under the water and coming out of the water to symbolize an old life being transformed into a new life. And so Jesus himself, you would think, Jesus, why would he have to be baptized? He's the son of God. And yet he was demonstrating for all of us in his humanity what it, mean, what it means to be an obedient servant of the king, the father, God. And so this goes into, in, there are two passages which really uh, give this story out. One's in Matthew chapter 4 and one is in Luke chapter 4. They're slightly different in that the orders are, are a little bit different, but the same story. We're going to take it from Luke chapter 4 today, but you can reference Matthew chapter 4, as I will, a little bit at the end of the message. Uh, At the very first verse of chapter 4 in the book of Luke, if you're familiar with Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the Gospels, all the story of Jesus, Jesus, catch these words, full of the Holy Spirit, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan, that's where he was baptized, that's the Jordan River, and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Now let's back up just a little bit because we have to go and look at the story of where he was baptized to get the context for this. At the end of uh, chapter 3, it says, when all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. And he was praying, as he was praying, heaven was opened and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son. Of course, this is God speaking to his son, whom I love, with you I am well pleased. The obedience that you're showing me at this moment, I am well pleased with it. And now Jesus was about 30 years old when he began his ministry. So 30 years in, here he is baptized in the Jordan River. He is proclaimed to be the son of God. He says, you are my son, and I'm pleased with you. So it goes into this first verse of chapter 4. So he is full of the Holy Spirit and led into the wilderness by the Spirit. And you would say, huh? Why would God lead me into the wilderness? That's what I want us to discover today. Have you ever felt like you experienced the wilderness? I bet we all have in some form where we have these trials, these dark times, these difficult moments. When we go through life, we enter life and we think it's all going to be fine. Have you ever, you know, if you're a married person, you know, you enter marriage and you think, oh, this is going to be just easy. Then you start realizing there are moments of wilderness. Maybe you've experienced it at a work situation. You walked into this job thinking it was going to be this perfect job and then you realize, oh, wait, I have to work with people. And people are imperfect. And there becomes this relationship conflict. And so we, we start walking in the wilderness. Well, Jesus enters the wilderness, but he is full of the Spirit, and he is led there by the Spirit. It's for a purpose. And I want us to figure out today, what is the purpose of being in the wilderness? Why would God put me in the wilderness? Why would he allow me to go through the time in the wilderness? Why would he allow Jesus, of all people, to go through the wilderness? Why would he have to suffer that? So it says he went into the wilderness where he was there for 40 days. Not 72 days, 40 days. But I can guarantee you when you are without food for 40 days, it changes the game. It changes your headspace. It changes what's going on around you in your mind, in your physical being. And he ate nothing during those days. Imagine that. And at the end of those days, he states the obvious here, he was hungry. He was hungry. So the devil said to him, now here, we don't see the devil, you know, standing here with, you know, don't don't you ever see the devil in pictures and it's like he's got these horns and he's got this tail and he's red. And like, the fact is the devil doesn't even say that he's described how he approaches this situation, but the devil is like the enemy. He's, He's the deceiver. It doesn't say he's even standing there. The devil himself is there in the midst of the wilderness speaking to him. Have you ever had those evil thoughts? Had those hard moments where something is pressing into you. You maybe can't put it in words or you can't tangibly see it or know it, but it's there. And the devil said to him these words, if you are the son of God, if you are the son of God. So he's already starting to question. You've been called the son of God. Okay, that's great. If you are the son of God, tell this stone to become bread. Why in the world are you hungry, Jesus? If you're the son of God, why would you have to go through this? I mean, God would not want you to be hungry. You're, you've been sent in here to show your power, to show that you don't have to, 
to live with this pressure anymore. You can put life into your own hands. You can actually grab onto whatever you need right now. Grab onto it. If you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone. Now, you'll notice that if you have it in your Bible, you notice that's in quotes. And you say, well, why is it in quotes? Because it comes from the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy in the Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, they're all this story. Not only Genesis of the beginning of time, but then the next few books, it's, it's what the next book is called Exodus. And Exodus is this land mass of people who are going out of slavery into freedom. His chosen people, the Israelites, we won't go into the history of it, but he has this chosen people called the Israelites, and they are taken out of slavery, out of Egypt, and now he's guiding them into freedom, toward freedom, toward the promised land. But they have to go through this wilderness. If you remember, they went through the wilderness for 40 years. Not 40 days, nice parallel though, 40 years. And he quotes that passage. If If I can, if you'll just allow me for a second, I guess I have it marked here. In Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse, I'll start at verse 2. It says, remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness for 40 years to humble and test you in order to know what was in your heart. I'm going to read it again because this is the theme of the morning. This is what I want you to know why he takes you into the wilderness, okay? Remember how the Lord, your God, led you, remember Jesus was led there, by the Spirit, full of the Spirit, led you all the way in the wilderness these 40 years to humble and test you in order to know what was in your heart. That's why you go in the wilderness, to identify what's really in your heart. Not only will God know what's in your heart, which he already does, but more importantly, you will then know what's in your heart. And then you can determine what to do from there. He humbled you, causing you to hunger, and then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your ancestors had known, to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. So he was quoting that passage from Deuteronomy, this old passage to the Israelites. Little hint here, the Israelites were given the test in the wilderness, and how did they do? Not very well. Not very well. In fact, they they succumbed to the pressure around them. We'll see it again in the next two temptations. And the fact is that when the devil comes alongside you, he's going to try and twist and turn and deceive and pull and get you to think about the idea of moving from dependence to independence. That's what he does in the wilderness. The devil has a job and God has a job in the wilderness. And your job is to determine what is in your heart. So Jesus answered, it's written, man shall not live on bread alone. So the devil led him up to a high place. Now just imagine, this is more of a a metaphorical statement, I would believe it. He has him see something. He has a vision. The devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all the authority, all their authority and splendor. It has been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want to. If you worship me, it will all be yours. That's what the devil is saying here in this moment. Evil is saying the earth can be yours. Everything in the earth can be yours. I have the authority over it, and I want to give it to you. Now, that's a lie anyway, but he wants to deceive the Son of God. He wants to do anything he can to attack him in this difficult moment, this moment of hunger, this moment of disillusionment perhaps. And Jesus answered very boldly and confidently, it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Guess where this comes from? the book of Deuteronomy. And so you go back and you check out very close to that in chapter 6. So it said, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And when I look back at chapter 6, it says in verse 13, fear the Lord your God and serve him only. Do not put the Lord your... And then in verse 16... It's going to say something very familiar to us, and I'll show you in just a moment how the parallel is. Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Well, how interesting that the next thing the devil says to him, he led him to Jerusalem, again, visionary speaking, and had him stand at the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up in their hands, 
so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered, it is said, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, Deuteronomy. It keeps going, this parallel back to the Israelites, the ones who went through a same test in the wilderness, and yet they failed, and Jesus said, I will not fail. I'm here to rewrite the story. I'm here to show you a new way. I'm showing that you ha don't have to succumb to the devil's schemes in the wilderness, even when you're hungry. Do you notice here that in two of the places he says, you are the son of God. He identifies him for who he is, but he twists it and says, no, you need to become independent. If you're the son of God, become independent. Feed yourself. Take this matter into your own hands. I like too how he, no, I don't like, but I like how we can acknowledge that the devil twists scripture. The very scripture that the devil quotes in that final uh, temptation is Psalm 91. Psalm 91, this praise story of how God comes alongside of us and, and takes us in our wilderness and he guards us and guides us and protects us and takes care of us. And Satan says, oh, if he is so caring and loving, why don't you jump from this high place and he will come and he will save you. The fact that Jesus knew the scheme of the devil, the scheme of the enemy, he was well advanced and he knew how to reply. In each case, Satan was inviting Jesus to move from dependence to independence. And every time Jesus said, no, I am fully devoted. I am full of the Spirit. I'm led by the Spirit. And I am utterly dependent on God. And we have to make a decision, no matter who you are. I mean, you, you just, is my life one where I am independent from God? Or I am fully dependent on God? We ask that every day of our lives. Whether you know it or not, every decision you make is in relation to the fact of whether you are fully dependent on God or you're living your own life away from him or apart from him. I mean, th that's not up to me. The Holy Spirit comes upon each person and, and you have to wrestle that through. And yet, our role as believers is to say, we are fully committed, even in the hardest moments, to be dependent on God. My sister sent me an article recently, partly because my home church is going through a struggle right now. We'll call it a time of wilderness, where they're having some struggles, as often any groups of people can do, but we hear that in churches and our hearts break. And it, it breaks in mind because these are people that I know and I love. These are people that came alongside me and, and taught me and spent time with me and poured into me, and yet I see them in the wilderness coming, and there are two sides. There are two sides, and it's been difficult. So she sent me this article in relation to that, but there was a final paragraph that I was sharing the other night at prayer meeting, and if you're not going to prayer meeting, I encourage you. We had a wonderful time the other night just in connecting. But this is the end of the, of the story that she sent. It said, what makes us truly believe as Christians, sorry, what makes us Christians is that we truly believe that Jesus is Lord. He is the king of the kingdom. So the core question of the kingdom is very different than the core question of the world. It is this, Lord, what would you have me do? Lord, what would you have me do? And Jesus, in his own, although it's not really recorded there, I can just imagine every time that the scheme came, he'd say, Lord, what would you have me do? How would you have me respond? Do you want me to be dependent right now or do you want me to go rogue? Do you want me to be independent? I don't think so. See, this is the Achilles heel that Satan tries to stick with all of us. He tries to have us make decisions apart from God or independent from God. He tries to divide and conquer us as we release ourselves from God. Surely God wouldn't want us to be hungry. Surely God wouldn't want us to go through these trials. Surely God want, wants me to, to find a way out on my own, right? That's why how he made me. He made me wired enough so that I can figure my own way. And yet he's saying, all of the pseudo joys that you settle for, all of the things you go and pursue, all those things that you could try and grab onto, all of the things that are offered to you, like the prize money in the, in the shows that I watch, or the willingness for the, the, the enemy to say, I can offer you so much more with what you see, this trade of earth for heaven. Well, we have to decide, Lord, what would you have me do? We see all these things around us that we would like to have, we think they might be the answer. Surely they'll satisfy us. And they'll not only satisfy us, they'll satisfy us right now. We talked about this. This is why certain people eat certain foods or engage in certain relationships. 
They'd rather have a bad relationship than no relationship. And people get this idea that they will solve their own problem. And the lie is that apart from God, there is fullness of joy. In fact, God says to us, in my presence, there is fullness of joy. Or we declare, in your presence, there is fullness of joy. So let's just ask, you know, in this interim, what decisions are we making? Have we made this week? Have we made this month? Are we about to make that are independent from God? That we're trying to figure out on our own? So at prayer meeting, uh, we were just praying, and, and God's, for whatever reason, given me this. Um, this has happened different times. And he'll just put a word on my heart. And so the word was, and sometimes I don't know why he puts the word on my heart. It's almost like I can see it. And so the word was transpose. I'm not, I mean, I, I like music, but I, I'm not a musician. And yet the word just came to me, transpose. And so what I often do is I'll just go and I'll look up what does the word mean because I don't want to assume that I understand it fully what it means. So when I looked it up, it said to cause two or more things to change places with each other, to transfer to a different place or a context, to interchange. And as I was thinking about this message, I think the enemy often tries to do this. He tries to transpose or interchange our dependence on God for independence from God. That's what he does. And this is all the more reason why we need to be full of the Spirit and led by the Spirit, even if it leads us into the wilderness, this land of great challenges and choices. It says in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, and you've heard this verse before, probably many of you, God is faithful. He will not be... He will not let you be tempted beyond what? What you can bear. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. Jesus was not being tempted beyond what he could bear. And believe it or not, you are never being tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. So this word transpose, it was on my heart. I, I thought about it for a bit, but then it really clicked for me when another word came into my heart. And, and the word was more phonetic this time. The word was troop. I thought, what is, sometimes when you get these things happening, you go, why? You know, well, how does this fit? And so the word troop, I, again, I looked it up. Why? And at first I said, you know, does this mean troop or troop? You know what I mean? Because it's spelled two different ways. And T-R-O-O-P or T-R-O-U-P-E. And so I looked it up and it said troop and troop both rhyme with group. I thought, oh, genius. Great. Um, but a troop with two O's is a group of soldiers where a troop O-U-P-E is a group of performers. And so I quickly thought God is looking to transpose us from being a group of independent performers, specialists in improvisation, a skill where we quickly manufacture the upcoming scene into a group of fully dependent soldiers who are skilled and ready to respond to the question, Lord, what you had me do? It's total allegiance. See, a rogue mission is one where you have made a conscious decision to no longer be obedient or controllable or answerable. You are a renegade, one who has broken an established treaty or an agreement. And I want to tell you this this morning. Satan invites us to go rogue. Satan invites us to go rogue. He's saying, go on your own. Go on that mission. Solve your own problem. And solve it today so that you don't have to suffer one more moment. God puts you in a place where he allows you to suffer so that you can identify what's truly in your heart. And many of us go rogue so that we never have to deal with what's in our heart. But when we get quiet enough, when we settle down enough, when we get to the place of peace, abide in him, just go to the quiet place, no matter whether you're a believer or not a believer, it will hit you hard. It will hit you hard. When you don't allow your body to feed on the all of the sights and sounds of the world around you, and you just stop for a moment, and you start getting hungry, you start getting hungry. You know what one thing the show taught all those people is that they learn things about themselves that they never knew before. In the alone place, in the quiet place. And that's what he allows us to do. He allows us to go to the wilderness. Jesus demonstrated unwavering loyalty in the wilderness, even in the wilderness. God calls us, like Jesus, to abide in him, to stay loyal to him, to trust in him, and experience full joy in him. So when we pray the prayer, Lord, what would you have me to do? We demonstrate that we've moved from being an independent performer, part of a troop, to a fully devoted and dependent soldier on a mission of love. 
Love for God and love for the world around us. And a successful walk with God only goes where the Father leads us. That's called discipleship. That's what the church is called to do. The church is called to, to ask that question repeatedly. Lord, what would you have me do? I'm not going rogue. I'm totally dependent on you. And you can't have it both ways. You can't say, oh, in this part of my life, I'm going to be fully dependent. And this part of my life, it's all on me. Like, you can't. You can't be split in your allegiance. It's fully, it's, you need to be fully given over to the one who's in control. I mean, some of you might call it legalism. You might say, oh, well, if I just follow the rules of the Bible, if I do this and do this and the Ten Commandments and all that, that's not what I'm talking about. In fact, I think the opposite is true. You can legally choose to solve your own problems. That's legalism. You have every right to go out and solve your own problems if, you're, if, that's, if you want to go rogue. You can enjoy whatever earthly pleasure you want. You can try to put God to the test, like asking God to prove himself or open a door or close a door, even though he's never asked you to pray that prayer or ask that question of him. He say, I mean, I'm not saying you, you, you never ask that question, but if he's never instructed you to ask that question of him, then you're going rogue. Because he may have already given you the answer, but you may not want that answer. But asking God in all things, what would you have me do? It's not legalism, it's allegiance. It's a dependent, respectful relationship. It's humility. It's sacrifice. It's surrender and trust and obedience and love. It's Jesus. So we, we think about Adam. When you go back in this passage, right before chapter 4, it says this. The very last thing that it said before chapter 4, you know what it said? It said, it's this genealogy. And often in the Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, you see in, it gives genealogies of so-and-so was the son of so-and-so, and so was, it's boring. But the fact is, it's, you know, you go down, the son of Methuselah, the son of Enoch, the son of Jared, the son of... I can't even pronounce him. Hallelel, the son of Kenan, the son of Enosh, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God. It identifies Adam as the son of God. And you know what? Adam was in the garden fully, full, fully fueled. He had everything he wanted at his disposal. He had everything that would satisfy his, his every need. And even there, the devil was able to come to him and twist him and move him and coerce him to go from a place of full dependence on God to a place of independence. So even in the garden, it was like his wilderness. In that moment when he was challenged, he let go. And so interesting that Satan addresses Jesus as the son of God because in the same way that there was a first Adam, if you ever hear it referenced that Jesus is the second Adam, it's like he's Adam reborn. And what I mean by that is not that he was physically Adam. What I mean is the same temptation that Adam went through and Eve went through and they failed at, the same temptation that the Israelites went through in the wilderness for 40 years and they failed at, Jesus has come to redeem. He said, I'm not going rogue. I'm not feeling the test. I'm fully dependent no matter what. And I want to show you that that's the way you need to live too. And I can just tell you from experience that when, we, that when we stay in allegiance with him and we don't go rogue, that's when things go right. It doesn't mean they go easier. It just means they go right. I'm not declaring here today that life as a believer doesn't have its times of wilderness. I'm just telling you that he is calling out to you to find out what is in your heart. Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness to humble and test you in order to know what was in your heart and whether or not you would keep his commands. It goes on to say, observe the commands of the Lord your God, for the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land. But be careful. Be careful that you don't forget the Lord your God, failing to observe his commands. Otherwise, when you eat and are satisfied, when you build fine houses and settle down, when your herds and flocks grow large and your silver and gold increase and all that you have is multiplied, then your heart will become proud, independent, rogue, and you will forget the Lord your God. And if you ever forget the Lord your God, you know what the punishment will be? And I use the word punishment. You know what, you know what the, you don't win the, the grand prize. I'll just tell you that. If you ever forget the Lord your God and follow other gods and worship and bow down to them, I testify today that you will surely be, the word they use is destroyed. But when you look at that word destroyed, I want you to understand in this context, destroyed means to render ineffective. It doesn't mean that you will lose your life. It just means that you will lose your impact. You will become ineffective in your mission. And who wants that? 
says, I want to come alongside you. I want you to succeed. I want you to win. I want you to get through this tough time, and I want you to do it with me. He leads us through the wilderness for a reason. The Lord's Prayer was offered by Jesus. He taught his disciples to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done. I trust you to supply for my daily need. And in Matthew 4.10, the same wilderness story includes this line after the devil's third attempt to lure Jesus to independence. He says, away from me, Satan. He says, it's enough. I, I get what you're trying to do, but can you just, in the authority of God, can you just leave? It's getting a little bit annoying. And so it says he did go away. He did go away for a time. Do you know what story that this passage is linked to when he says, go away from me, Satan? Did you ever hear that in the, past, in the scriptures too? He actually says it to a, one of his disciples. Jesus says this to Peter. Get behind me, Satan. Do you remember that? And what was the context? Jesus said, get behind me, Satan, to his disciples Peter, disciple Peter, because Jesus once again sensed a spirit of compromise. It says, Peter, it says there, Peter, you are a stumbling block to me, for you do not have the mind of the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. This is exactly the rogue kind of mission that Jesus said, I'm not interested in in any way. Get behind me. Go away. Whoever wants my dis- to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me even into the wilderness. That's, those are my words added to that. Whoever loses their life for me will find it. So when, I, when a test arises in my life, I have to ask myself, God, will you guide me through it? Or will I assert my own control? Will I settle for an earthly response? Will I put God to the test trying to force him to act on my behalf? Or do I rest in faith? Satan always tries to tempt us with idolatry or an easy way out. Well, let me go back to the show and just tell you one little part of the story. So in the show, some people were, you know, leaving because of their sickness or their cold or their wet, and that's natural. But after a while, there were people who were starting to realize that this is a game, and there is a prize to be won and big money on the line. And they started to change the game. In the Arctic, now just imagine sub-zero temperatures, one team went and stole the other team's sleeping bags. In response, that team then destroyed their boat. One team went after another guy, and then he decided he was going to set his things on fire so that they couldn't be caught by the other people. And one guy, an older gentleman, wrote late at night a letter to the person that was there on his team. There were only two of them left on the team because people had taken their way out of the game. He said, basically, I I need to go home. I came here for the money. I'm going to be honest with you. I came for the money. I could really use the money, and I would love to have the money. But I'm not willing to pursue the money in place of my integrity. Because this game has created something that I never intended to be part of, where people will cheat and lie and steal and destroy in order to gain an earthly prize. And so we left, and you know what? I think he won. I think he won. Sometimes we just need to realize that in the wilderness, there's something more great to be pursued or gathered than the earthly prizes this world will ever offer us. It can be so subtle. It can be so subtle. I just want to read to you a passage from something that I was reading. Just, I won't introduce it. I'll just read it. Few things threaten our faith more than when a good gift of God, beautiful and innocent in itself, slowly becomes necessary for our happiness. The most deadly appetites are not for the poison of evil, but for the simple pleasures of earth. For when these replace an appetite for God himself, the idolatry is scarcely recognizable and almost incurable. The simple pleasures of earth are good things, of course, a satisfying career, a healthy body, a best friend, a fulfilling marriage, and every other good gift comes down from the Father of lights, And like heaven themselves declares something of God's glory. When Paul says that God richly provides us with everything to enjoy, he really means this. Enjoy it. God's ocean of gifts is meant for swimming. But the simple pleasures of earth are never completely safe in the hands of sinners, even redeemed ones. Without care, we feast on the abundance of God's house and forget that it is his house. We eat and we eat and we gradually neglect the host. Eyes lower from heaven to earth. 
spiritual senses dull. Desires for other things begin to choke out the word. Last paragraph. In moments like these, it's one of God's severe mercies to deal with us as he dealt with Israel and to send us into the wilderness. You know, I, I would suspect that we would say we've all experienced the wilderness. God doesn't want to lead us into the wilderness to harm us. He leads us there to become completely dependent on him, to bring us to a deeper level of intimacy, to no longer view him as far away, and to come and know him as close and a confidant. And ultimately, he wants to know, and for you to know, and for me to know, what's in your heart. Today, I just, I just want to encourage you, I'll finish with scripture, from Deuteronomy chapter 30, and this again, same book, but it's an offer to you as it is to me, as it was to the Israelites. The Lord will again delight in you and make you prosperous, just as he delighted in your ancestors, if you obey the Lord your God and keep his commands and decrees that are written in his book. And turn to the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. What I am commanding you today is not too difficult for you beyond, or beyond your reach. Sometimes we think when we're in the wilderness, it's just too hard. Well, he's saying it's not too hard. It's not up in heaven, nor is it beyond the sea. No, the word is very near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart so that you may obey it. I set before you today life and prosperity, death and destruction. For I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in obedience to him, to keep his commandments, and then you will live and increase, and the Lord your God will bless you. Now choose life so that you and your children may live and that you may love the Lord your God. Listen to his voice and hold fast to him, for the Lord is your life. Have you ever been in the wilderness? If so, and if you are, and the question is, Lord, what would you have me do? Today, I just think it's fit for us to pray that as we close. Just say, Lord, first acknowledge what's in your heart. He'll show you. He'll show you. And if you feel that's difficult today, just take some time. In the next day or two, he'll show you. And then ask the honest question, Lord, what would you have me do? I'm just going to leave it in a time of silence for a moment, and then I'll just pray if that's okay. Just Allow the Lord to speak to you. Allow the Spirit to lead this next moment.